Hi everybody, it's Bob Ost, and it's Happy Friday, everyone. April Fools. I, I, have, I have no April Fools jokes prepared for you, but, but today is April Fools, and it really is April first, and this really is true, and this really is a true community gathering. So, not fooling you about any of it. Um, we're here. Uh, we're here every week. This is our 99th consecutive consecutive gathering it might be the hundredth actually i should check that if it's the hundredth we should be having a, a celebration um but we've been doing this since april 17th 2020 uh basically it was a, a way of dealing with the with shutdown uh i never thought the true was going to be virtual i never thought that i was going to know what zoom was um but life throws you some surprises and it's up to us to really embrace them and use them and learn from them, uh, which is what we've done. Uh, so every week we get people together in this room so that people don't feel isolated. Uh, now that we're going off into the real world, into live performance, uh, we still treasure what we've found here in Zoom, the ability to create a community that spans well beyond New York City. It's we have people from around the country. We have people from around the world. Today, we're very pleased to have uh, somebody from Germany and somebody from Australia, and uh, might have people from other places as well. And I just don't know it. Um, so it, it's uh, it's a it's been a gift. Uh, COVID has not been a gift, but it is in it's sort of given us tools or forced us to learn how to do things in a new way. Uh, and I think that. As we move into live performance, we're going to consider can we're going to continue to do uh, things virtually as well. Uh, I think I think that's pretty much most most of us in the arts uh, finally surrendered. <laughs> we surrendered to virtual um, and finally said, okay, this has some use. This has some value. Um, so we've talked about. Anything I can think of to talk about every week. It's 99, 99 consecutive weeks of, of conversations. Um, and I've always actually wanted to have a conversation uh, with uh, APAP, uh, APAP. It's, a, it's an organization um, I'm going to introduce you to. I'm going to introduce you to Sue Noseworthy in a second. And I'm also going to introduce you to Mr. Mojo, who is a, a, an artist, uh, a performing artist who has made very good use of this particular association, this, per, this service organization. Well, it's, it is a service organization for the, for the performing arts community. Um, and let's, uh, let's bring them in right now. I'm going to bring in Sue and, and Mojo. Hi, Sue. Hi, Mojo. How are you doing? All well. Good evening, guys. Thanks for having us. Oh, my pleasure. I, I, you know I've been trying to get you on for a year. <laughs> Bob, Bob, you have the patience of a saint. I have to tell you, you are wonderful. Thank you for, for putting up with all of our postponements. But yeah, my, my, the, ne the next wall I want to break down is MIFA, the New York Foundation for the Arts. I've been trying to get that for a year or two. Um, it's going to happen soon. Uh, can, can tell us what APAP stands for and also tell us what it used to stand for. It, it has changed its branding. Yes, actually, it's changed multiple times. Um, yeah, so just um, who I am, I'm Sue Noseworthy, the membership director here at APAP, which is Association of Performing Arts Professionals, but we're commonly and affectionately known as APAP. Um, and we are a national service advocacy and membership organization for the live performing arts. Um, and yes, um, Bob is right. Um, when we were founded in 1957 um, by a very small group of presenters, um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, the first name was the Association of College and University Concert Managers. So it actually started with a very small group of presenters. Um, we have changed our name multiple times over the years. The other acronyms, I don't know if I could tell you off the top of my head, but our latest um, big name change was um, going from the Association of Performing Arts Presenters to the Association of Performing Arts Professionals, which was a really important change because um, our name now reflects really the full depth and breadth of our membership is much more inclusive of the entire arts ecology. So we're very helpful that we have, you know, made that shift to be more inclusive. 
Right. I, and, and I actually hadn't realized that it had changed over to professionals until like last week. <laughs> it's like, I, because I've known you for so, for so long and I've known you with, I, in order for me to describe APAP, I always had to explain to people what the difference was between a producer and a presenter. Uh, and uh, I don't have to do that now. <laughs> although, although I think it's still relevant information. I think it's important for people to actually understand that. We can we can get to that in a moment. But first, I want to introduce Mojo. Mojo, say hi to us. Say hi, Mojo, in the Bayou. Um... Gypsies. 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 Bayou. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, but I, I might have got the wrong email. I, I thought I was supposed to talk about uh, training alligators for security duty at APAP. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, we we all are interest, intrigued by that right now. Um, it, okay, alligators uh, are are a big are a big force in our culture right now. There you go. There you go. Food, shelter, and clothing at times. <laughs> uh, my name is Mojo from Mojo and the Bayou Gypsies. Uh, I've been in the industry for uh, 50, 58 years right now. My fifty ninth year will begin in September. Our show, Mojo and the Bayou Gypsies. Uh, we're in our 37th season. We'll be in our 38th season starting in May. Uh, we've gone all the way from nightclubs and bars uh, through corporate events on up to the world's finest concert stages where we are now. Uh, and APAP has been a big part of my life and career for the last 21 years. Okay, so basically we're looking at APAP from two different perspectives. We're looking at it from the perspective of, of the association and, and the services that it provides. We're also looking at it from the active participation of, uh, of an artist and how, how he takes advantage of the services that, that APAP uh, provides everybody. So um, let's, let's start with Sue. Sue, can you sort of lay out, the, the, give us the lay of the land? Uh, how APAP works and what it does. Yeah, yeah. What I wanted to start with is just kind of give you guys just a, a few stats of, you know, who we are. I, you've had a description of the organization, a little bit of our history, but um, who are our members, I think is important for you to know as well. Um, the membership is really made up of arts professionals from every segment of our field. We have artists, agents, managers, producers, presenters, consultants, vendors, students, um, I mean, that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg. It really um, is such a wide variety of professionals in our industry, which is really wonderful. Um, we have about 1,500 members. That number does change. We do tend to increase our membership numbers as we get closer to our conference, and I will talk quite a bit about our conference in a little bit. Um, our membership is made up of both organizational and individual members, but when you count the staff of our member organizations, we really serve over 5,000 performing arts professionals um, really every day. Um, our members are from all 50 states and 34 countries, so we, we have a really wide expanse around the world. Um, in terms of where folks are located in the US, about 58% of our members are on the East Coast, you know, Florida going all the way up, 16% um, in the Midwest, so we have, we have uh, less concentration there, and then 26% are West Southwest, so our, our, you know, a lot of our members are, are Eastern. Um, and I can talk, one of the things I did want to talk about, Bob, because I know you know, we will focus on conference, but I, I, I did have a, a little bit of information prepared about our other benefits and services. If now is a good time. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. And for sure, I mean, you know, APAP is synonymous with our, our annual conference. I mean, I think for many people, that is the, the key benefit and service that um, many people have in mind and for good reason, because it's a very successful event um, and people do have, um, you know, great experiences there with uh, buying art and selling art. So it's, there's a reason it's so popular. Um, but we do have a few other benefits and services. I did want to share some information with you guys about, you know, very quickly. Um, we do have a job banking career center and it is free for job seekers, just as an FYI, you don't have to be a member to use that component of our website. It's incredibly popular. Um, so if you are job hunting, if you know colleagues who are job hunting, again, in any segment of the field, please um, send them to our job bank. I can put some URLs in the chat in a, in a little bit. Um, 
We also offer a week bi-weekly members only newsletter with field information updated on our programs and benefits. It contains industry news, funding opportunities. So that's another great benefit of membership. Um, another benefit that I think might be incredibly appealing to your um, cohort here is APAP does have a live performance calendar. Um, it's a growing multidisciplinary online showcase, basically of in-person or online performances and events. Um, and it's, you know, populated by our very diverse members. Um, it's been an increasingly popular tool for people to list their shows. Um, it is a members only uh, tool and, and database. So if you're interested in listing your show in the performance calendar, um, you know, that's a, that's a great member benefit. I have a question about that. Would it be appropriate for, for True to list our programs on your, on your calendar? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You, there, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, you could even list this. Um, well, I'm thinking the weekly, this weekly gathering that we do. Yeah, I think so. I'll, I'll find out if, if people do um, post webinars and things I can ask Bob, it can't hurt to ask, but I would imagine right. it could be posted. Well, certainly we'll, we'll, we'll try to uh, post our play reading series when we do that. Yes, absolutely, for sure. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll just mention, um, because I think it's a, a great opportunity to chat with APAP leadership, is every month we have something called Real Talk in Real Time, our listening lounge, we call it. Um, and it's really a wonderful chance. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty casual Zoom meeting that we have once a month. Um, where you have an opportunity to meet face to face with both APAP staff and our board and leadership to, you know, really talk about what's on your mind. Um, some of the sessions are programmed. We, we recently have one that we asked that the focus be on racial equity, diversity and inclusion, but a lot of times we, we do have people submit topics that they want to talk about in advance and we do make time for them so you know, anything that's on all of our collective minds, like, you know, how artists in the Ukraine are, are faring and, and or what's going on with climate crisis and how is that impacting our field? So it's a it's something I wanted to mention because it's also a great opportunity to talk to our new president and CEO, Lisa, um, who is wonderful, and also our board and our board president. So um, I would encourage um, if you do join to join us for those conversations because um, they can be pretty rich. And I think sometimes it's hard to get FaceTime with CEOs and this gives you a great chance to start to get to know our leadership. So I did wanna mention that. Well, thank Sue, you. Could you please, could you please uh, tell a little bit about the affinity groups? Sure, yes. So as part of our conference, we are, well, we kind of launched it at conference, but we are, are doing more um, either topic specific or, um, you know, life, specific uh, affinity groups where where job alike or um, you know identity alike groups can join like LGBTQ um, you know playwrights or marketing staffs of pro professional uh, performing arts centers um, and those are getting underway. I think there was something like 50 or 60 um, affinity groups that um, were developed as part of conference and we are, beginning to roll those out so that those are year round communities where people can come together um, and share information with one another. Um, do, did you have a, uh, have a link somewhere in there so that people can actually uh, find you and, and start making inquiries about become, becoming part of, parts of these different programs? Yes, what I'll do um, is share my email in the chat um, when I when I have a break from speaking so that you guys can, if any any of the items I'm talking about today, you have questions, you can reach out to me and I'd be happy to help you. So I want to go back to one of the definitions that I, it just seems obvious, but a lot of people are not clear about it. Uh, explain to people what presenters are, because one of the things that you offer is an opportunity for people to be seen by, by possible presenters for their work. Sure. Lean forward, lean forward. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna go to our formal definition of, of a presenter. Um, 
it's a uh, facility or program or entity, or it could even be a person um, who presents artists and pays artist fees. Um, like I said, it could be a facility program person and they wish to find artists, agents and managers for performances that they are are putting on, you know, stages or in venues. That's the the typical definition of presenter that we use. So, um, Mojo, uh, bef before you actually knew APAP, before you were part of APAP, tell us a little bit about about you as an artist and what you were doing, and let's talk about how you found your way to APAP and how it helped you. Okay, that. Uh... That's an interesting story. I started performing when I was 11 years old back in 1963 as a pro. Uh, and in the process of doing that, playing literally all the different genres of American music, I worked my way up from uh, when I was a teenager, we were doing uh, socials and dances and ballrooms. And we grew into the nightclub circuit and we were doing nightclubs until uh, 1994. We had worked our way up to the number one nightclub in the United States. And when I went to collect the check, they tried to stiff me. And I said, uh, I'm not gonna work here anymore. I walked in the dressing room and said, this is our last performance in a nightclub, unless it's a benefit. Uh, from there, we moved into corporate events. We had been doing corporate events uh, and it was very lucrative and very popular. Uh, it's a different business model from the performing arts in that uh, the event is the focus, and sometimes you have 15 or 20 agents trying to get the event, and you're in every one of their packages, so the odds of you landing a corporate event are pretty high if the, if the agents all know you. I worked with 600 and, 660 agents in those days. Uh, then 9-11 uh, uh, happened, and the Enron and WorldCom scandals happened. And the result of those, two, those three events was that you couldn't put crowds together and corporations stopped doing corporate events because they didn't want to open their books to the feds. We quickly started working almost entirely in the performing arts. The performing arts is a different game from all the others in that, uh, hang on, you just went dark. Are you still there? What happened was somebody came into the room oh, okay. and hadn't, didn't have their video okay. off. Okay, yeah. so uh, the, uh, when, when we got into performing arts, uh, we found that the, the, the supply chain, it is a supply chain, uh, there are artists and there are audiences. And between the artists and audiences, there is a supply chain. Presenters who present artists to audiences and make the connection, agents and managers who present artists to presenters so the connection can be made with audiences, and self-represented artists like myself who run their whole business. They just had to learn how to do it because they've been doing it forever and they just never found playmates that added value. So for me, I've been a self-represented artist now for a lifetime. Uh, at APAP in particular, I discovered APAP when we went full-time in the performing arts. And I, I was told to move from regional conferences where we had been into the APAP organization and experience it. Uh, and what I discovered there was a uh, a world of A-class, world-class presenters, agents, managers, and artists. For me, it was a very wonderful relief uh, to find a, a community that was supportive and really professional and crackerjack, world-famous people you're working with. Uh, and it, it was just a, a fabulous connection that we made. In the process of working with uh, as a member and consultant and advisor and friend of the APAP organization and all our member organizations, I made some of the best friends and business connections of my entire life worldwide. The overwhelming majority of our performances in Europe came through APAP, uh, participating in their conference. Uh, the overwhelming majority of my friends in show business uh, who are in my daily life came from APAP as we met over the years. And the show business family in particular is a family that you, you gain through life and living uh, because you're not home. And you'll have births and deaths and weddings and all kinds of happy and sad things happening, but you're not home. And your family is on the road with you. Uh, and those are the people who are in APAP, the real warriors who've been in it for decades, 
uh, new people who are anxious to be in it for decades, for a lifetime. It's a wonderful community of support, shared knowledge, uh, and uh, interesting competition. Uh, and in the process of doing that, I wound up uh, getting involved in NAPAMA, which was a, an organization that really kind of grew out of APAP that focused on the uh, North American performing arts managers and agents and presenters and independent artists. Uh, and it really grew up in the APAP community to focus on business of the arts, which is where the return on investment can come for the members of TRUE. Uh, getting connected. Once you have your product developed or you are looking for someone to, to produce with or present your, your works, APAP is the place to find people of great so, substance. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, let's talk about the sorts of the sorts of performance that are suited to APAP and what things may be harder uh, to, to make connections with. I mean, I, I don't think like a, a 14 character, uh, 14 actor musical is necessarily something that's going to get easily booked through these channels, but you can tell me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> You're so, wrong. So, so t tell me about that. So, so what are the things, what are the things that people can think about? I have to mute well, some people. Give me a second. Okay. There we go. Um, okay. If you, if you think about it, uh, just basic things like every famous Broadway play, every famous Broadway musical, every famous book, um, every character you see on television, every character you see in the theater, <laughs> they're all at APAP. Their artists, uh, the artists are there, their agents are there, their managers are there, so and I'm there are people to, from all over the world. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue, I'm gonna continue along these lines because I, because I, I, I sense that there are people in the room who, who will wanna know these things. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're somebody that's not well known, and you have a show. How do you how do you enter this world and and get noticed? And how do you not get swallowed up in the crowd? Sue, do you want to tell them, or you want me to tell them? Um, yeah. I, and actually, I I do want to go um back just a little bit, Bob, if that's okay, to just kind of give an overview of the different components of the conference, because that right. might be helpful if, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah, just to, just to kind of in, introduce you to just a few of the basic things um, about the conference. For those of you who don't know, I'm, you know, we, we shouldn't assume that everybody knows exactly what APAP is and how it works. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the conference is held every January in New York City, um, usually within the first few weeks of the month. This year's upcoming conference will be January 13th through 17th. Those are the in-person dates. Um, the hub of the conference um, is the Hilton Midtown and Towers, um, but there are events and showcases all over the city during that week. It's really a citywide event, although again, there are quite a few things happening at the Midtown, um, Hilton Midtown and Towers. Um, and again, attendees are from all over the field any kind of genre you can think of, any kind of discipline. Um, we do tend to draw between 3,500 and 4,000 attendees. So there are quite a few people there. 60% um, of our attendees identify themselves as executive leadership slash decision makers. And 33% are programmatic staff. So those are you know, the, the programming staff who are there at our conference to look at shows to potentially book. So just wanted to throw some stats out there so you have an awareness of who is coming. Um, the other thing is worth noting because I know, you know, newcomers can sometimes feel a little intimidated by our conference because it is so big, very different from the smaller regionals. You know, every year, 24% of our attendees identify as new colleagues. And I'll talk more about mentoring in a few minutes, but. Um, if you are a, a first timer to APAP, do not make that, you know, make you have second thoughts or, or say, oh, it's, you know, it's not for me. Um, you know, quite a few people come for the very first time. So I, I did want to throw that out there. Um, so yes, there are, are three pillars, what we call them, um, for the conference. The first 
being professional development and networking. Um, and that includes all of our programming, plenaries, keynotes, um, concurrent sessions and workshops. Um, so that's sort of like more of the everybody getting together and talking about ideas, what's going on in our field, what are, what's the latest information, what, what, are, what are people dealing with, right, on a daily basis. Um, and then you have the other two components, which are more, you know, the business of what we all do. Um, the first of which is our expo hall, and that is our trade show um, and marketplace, the booths. And then the other one is the showcase performances. And those can range from a full performance production down to a 15 minute snippet expert. Um, those are put on by the artist agents and managers. So um, those are kind of the three pillars. I'm guessing most of you will probably wanna drill down a little bit more into the expo, but maybe perhaps more focus on showcasing. I don't know, Bob, if you had, you know, thoughts about that. But well, what I was thinking of, what I'm thinking about already is, um, what are the what are the tools that they should come with um, so that they can be effective when they go to the conference? Sure. Um, I mean, I would say step one is introduce yourself to me and my team, and tell us you know, what you do, what particular part of the field you live in, um, what are your professional goals for the conference, what do you even know about APAP? Um, it's also helpful for us to know if you've uh, attended other booking conferences, because those can give you a baseline of information like, oh, yes, I did PAE a few years ago, or yes, I've done, you know, NACA or WA, um, you know, that can help us learn a little bit more. But the more you reach out to staff as sort of your starting point, and we get to know you and your needs, we can kind of help direct you to really good resources. Um, we do have quite a few uh, pages with FAQs, we have webinars, um, we do have a mentoring program, which again, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, um, which, you know, does provide, you know, very specific information on how to set yourself up for success um, if attending for a first time um, attendee. But I would say item one on your checklist would be reach out to me and to my associate, Keisha. And again, I'll put our, our emails in the... Um, in the chat, but we are sort of the, the first staff who, you know, it's part of our jobs, it's part of our deep love to, you know, welcome our first timers, welcome our newcomers and get everybody situated where they feel really comfortable going into their first APAP conference. So let me see if I could break this down. I mean, I'm, I'm a playwright, so I'm, I'm putting myself into the character of somebody who's coming to the conference. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that, that that I want to I want to connect with you. I, I get that. Um, what are what are my goals going to be? Am I do I want to be seen? Do I want to be performing? Do I want to have a booth? Uh, how do I want to present myself so that people will be interested in me? And if if I if I'm not offering an opportunity for you to see me do my do my do my art do my whatever it is I do performing, um, are there other tools that I can have? so that I can interest, hopefully interest people in, in wanting to know more about me? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it really depends, Bob. I don't, there's definitely not a one size fits all. I mean, we, we do tend to recommend that people come to their first APAP um, and if possible, not um, buy an expo booth, maybe showcase um, because it does, help to attend and get a lay of the land because what we recommend is you come and you kind of look around like okay I see this showcase is really packed let me take a look at their marketing material let me let me take a look at how this showcase room is set up and you know how many people are performing over the course of two hours um you, you know interviewing artists who you think wow that person did a really great showcase and saying you know please walk me through, like, how did you, how did you set this up? And what were, you know, again, the associated costs involved in 
getting yourself together for APAP. Um, there's not necessarily a one size fits all. It will kind of depend on, you know, the person's background and, and history in our industry, um, you know, their, their awareness of, of all the different components of APAP coming into it. I mean, Mojo might have more advice on this front I because I know he's directly worked with so many first time attendees. Um, I mean, does this kind of sound like a, like, yeah. How would you, how would you mentor people? Cause I've heard, I've heard you say that you've actually mentored people. Yes. For years. The, um, the, the most important thing I'd like to back up just a little bit. Um, it's funny. When, after, when after, you you spoke, to, after you spoke, Sue said she wanted to back up a little bit. Now she spoke and you're saying you want to move. So we might as well go back to well, the beginning. <laughs> well, no, we're just going to, we're just going to uh, hit rewind for a short brief. Okay. Second. Uh, the, the thing that is most important in my opinion is you have to have something of value that others will be interested in knowing about. You have to, I hate to say it, but whatever you are creating is a product in the world. And you have to have a product of interest and value when you go to APAP. So you have something to talk about. Um, it's nice to get to know people. And, and some people go to APAP for socializing, uh, but they're already very well established in the field. Everybody knows what they do. Uh, I've showcased at APAP for 21 years even though everybody knows what I do and, and they've all seen my show and they still come anyway, but it's something of value because they have a really good time. Uh, and that's, that's what I sell. I sell a lifetime memory uh, and, and a really great time. So everyone that comes to APAP literally has something of interest and value to share with everyone else. A presenter might have a fabulous theater that is the perfect space for a playwright to bring his play or her play to reality. Um, uh, a playwright might have a fabulous book ready to go for the right theater company. And there are lots of theater companies there. To so you're, you're, to. you're answering Eric Sirota's uh, question. It's, it's Eric really Sirota was having, asking, Eric Sirota was asking whether there was, there was value for a writer. So you're, you're actually ans answering that. You're saying, yes, writers, writers have their place at, 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 at APAP. Right. I mean, I've, I've, because, because I'll, I'll in, be honest with you, Mojo, my, my thinking would have been that, that you needed to have a, a, a show, a finished product, not just, not just a script, but a production that was ready to go and ready to, to, to be booked. Not necessarily. I mean, okay. if you're, if you're there, the business side of APAP is connecting audiences and artists and the managers and agents and the presenters are in between making that connection. So the artist and the audience can connect intimately in a theater. Um, but the entire supply chain is represented there. There may be, uh, you, you may have a, a book that you've written. I'm talking about a script. Uh, some of us call it a book, okay? Like the, we, like we the, don't, the we, say, for we say script here. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so uh, you if it's, a, if it's, it's a book, we talk about the book to a musical, which is also called a libretto. So okay, okay. it's all semantics, it doesn't matter. Oops. I just, what did I do to you? What did I do to Mojo? There he is. Nothing. That was a self-defense move. I was being assaulted by a red wasp. <laughs> oh, oh. Hang on. Hang so on. As long as it wasn't on. me. Let me get back oh, here. Boy. Let me get back here. Okay. So uh, you, you will find colleagues there, but you, you really have to have something of value to share with others. Um, I've met a lot of, uh, I met movie producers there who wanted to use my music. Uh, I've met voiceover artists who wanted to use my music. I've met theater owners and presenters and producers who wanted to use my show. Uh, and I've, I've also produced hundreds and hundreds of showcases in the last 35, 40 years. So I've seen everything. I've had actors. In fact, Heather Massey, I don't remember if Heather actually showcased in my showcase room or not. But uh, uh, Heather not is not yet. OK, well, Heather is uh, is a, a good case. She'd be the ideal representative of someone who is a true member who also has really profited and done well in the APAP community. 
So I, I would suggest she be the next one on your on your uh, presentation. Uh, we had her last two weeks ago. <laughs> ah, okay. Right. I was actually trying to, make, get, I'm trying to get. Did she mention me? <laughs> of course she did, glowingly, glowingly. <laughs> Uh, the, it was we we actually had uh, guests from the Atlantic uh, Mid Atlantic Fo um, Arts Foundation who uh, basically uh, give grants for people to to uh, bring their shows to Europe, uh, and I actually wanted to have APAP on with them because I thought it would be an interesting um, it would work it just would work together, but it, it, that didn't happen. So they were Heather was th was then and you're t you're now. Oh, and Mid Atlantic okay. Arts is for anywhere in the world not just Europe, so keep that in mind. Right, okay. So uh, are we helping you? Are we answering your questions? Uh, you're answering my questions. I'm, I'm curious whether the room has any questions. I'm, um, Mike Matt says, I went one year and found it fascinating and exhausting. Bring them on. My impression was that attendees were, were more presenters, people looking for self-contained shows in their myriad forms. Jersey Boys was hot then and there were a dozen four season shows um so that that's similar to my my impression you're you're you're, you're changing my impression of it a little bit uh today uh i thought that that people were looking for shows that were put together and ready to go it's just like okay you're booked can you well, come some come? people are yeah, yeah. But, but yeah some people are bob some people are looking for the next season some people are looking for five seasons down the road. Some people are looking for colleagues. Some people are looking for playmates who want to create together. Uh, mm -hmm. And we wound up, you know, I can only speak from my own experience. I have worked with so many people performing around the world that we connected at APAP and thought it'd be a good idea. So I'm going to move to Sue for, for a question based on Emma Wood's question. Um, now that you've gone through two years, uh, of shutdown and you've actually had to do things online. Are you going to continue having a virtual uh, component of your of your APAP? Um, yes, the answer is yes. Um, we we do believe we will continue to have virtual components. Um, however, you know, we know we've been hearing, I'm sure you all have been hearing that there is a weariness uh, for online. Um, it doesn't quite um, sufficiently meet all of our needs because this is an in-person business people need to see each other in the flesh they need to see artwork in the in person um you know i anticipate it will not be as robust um you know as it has been if we are able to have an in-person conference we will continue to offer online um options but um as i'm sure you can imagine you know, if we are able to have our in-person conference, you know, in-person showcasing, in-person booths will, you know, more than likely be the pathway most people will, will take. So, so um, Emma's asking because she's in Australia. She doesn't think she's going to be able to come in for, for the conference. So she wants to be able to participate in a different way. Yes, and we will, we will absolutely have that option. And I think if there is a demand for virtual booths um, and virtual showcases, again, we will continue to have that because, you know, we know, you know, not everyone, even domestically, not everyone is back, you know, pre-COVID budget numbers, pre-COVID seat sales, um, you know, people are coming back slowly. Um, you know, some of our presenters still have travel restrictions they can't come to our conference so that's a challenge too because we want presenters there um, to, to see the artwork but yes there will be uh, virtual components um, for you know presenters producers artists agents managers that what that will not go away just so you know good okay well for, for me Bob for me, Bob, the, the most important things at APAP that, that give me the highest return on investment, obviously, is the marketplace, uh, doing the transactions that connect audiences and artists together among the community of presenters, agents, managers, and self-represented artists. That's the number one thing for me. But there's also fabulous professional development. There's also constant advocacy on behalf of the performing arts at a national and even international level. Uh, there is a, a huge mentoring program 
collegial relationships that build and, and last forever. Uh, I am now watching probably the third generation of people that I've worked with. And I've actually walked into other conferences where 75% of the artists represented were my mentees. These are fabulous things. You You're know, a busy uh, guy. <laughs> I, uh, I'm just, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm hyperactive. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, honestly, honestly, the thing about APAP is that it's international, it's powerful, it's thorough, it's very much enriching, uh, and it, it really hits every nail in the supply chain that you're working with. Uh, great, great organization, in my personal opinion, it's been great for me. And so far, all of my mentees really like it. The young people like it, and it, it just keeps moving forward. And it's a <clears throat> it is a membership organization. So let's 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 it talk. It is for it a is a membership. That. It's a membership organization that is not changing its mission, but it's adapting to reality, which is a powerful statement. Um, so what is it? What what is the cost for for an artist to become a member? Yeah, let me um, get to that in my notes. But I did want to just also. Um, round out since mojo did mention the mentoring program to just give a little bit more info about that um i think apap you know has a, a very nice very robust mentoring program usually what we have the first day of the conference is an enormous session it's in you know one of the biggest rooms of the hilton hotel um called the new colleague orientation where about 10 new colleagues uh first timers are matched with uh two roughly um mentors at a table everybody kind of goes around talks about their needs asks their questions um, of their mentor a lot of people exchange numbers um you know, and, and make sure they connect with one another even after that event. Um, it's, it's a, like Mojo said, it can be a nice way to make uh, connections that last, you know, a career long. And then the other, you know, great thing is that the staff is also, like I said, here for you if you you know, in the middle of the conference, if you can't find your mentor, you can't even remember your mentor's name and you're like, ah, I have, so I have a question about something really important. Can, you know, Sue, can you help me find a mentor? Um, you know, we, we can assist with that as well um, and, and sort of connect you to someone who could provide, uh, you know, listen to what your goals are. Again, listen to what kind of show you have, listen to your readiness and you know do you have a website do you have a you, you know a tech sheet do you, i mean hear about sort of where you are in your um you know ability to to work with performing arts facility to get your shows booked and we you know we can really work with you to um give you some advice about next steps so i just wanted to share that about about mentoring that we do we are able to provide, I think, some some nice support there. And it was nice, very nice to hear that, you know, Heather and uh, Mojo's uh, mentoring information, that's super helpful and great yeah, and just plus, great to hear. Plus, so, Sue, so uh, what, are the, what are the levels well, wait, of membership? One second, well, one second, Bob, one second, Bob. I okay. want to just add, add to what Sue said. When she said there are tables of 10 people with two mentors, that's interesting, but you got to remember there's at least 50 tables like that. Yeah in that That's room. Right. We have hundreds and hundreds of new colleagues every year. And usually within two or three years, they are the mentors in the new colleague room. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make it easy for people to to make, take the next step and, and actually join and, or consider joining. And uh, so uh, I, they, they need to know wh what, what they have to do and what the different levels of membership are. Also, I, I do want to go back to Eric Sirota again. Um, he has he has a whole bunch of questions. He's he's one of the writers in the room. Um, so we, we've clarified that he that you don't have to have a. He said so. The thing that is being booked as a traveling production of a show is that correct? Sometimes the the answer sometimes. to that is sometimes. Um, so so what Eric and the writers need to know is you can make connections through APAP that can eventually lead to your show being presented or produced. Um, presenters are not necessarily producers though. Um, Correct. So, right. so normally, if you're going to be be booked by a presenter, you probably need to have a producer on board to put the pieces together so that you have a, a coherent whole that you can put on stage. Uh, am I? Have I got it so far? 
Um, I'm trying to think what other what are the what are the other aspects of his question. Um, artists does not mean performers in this case, uh, although the people that probably do well at a situation like that are probably performers because that's their personality. They, if you're a writer who's sh who's shy, you may not do as well as as a Mr. Mojo who's who's got his whole. <laughs> Who pull persona on and ready to present, um, and and that's actually probably not a bad a bad thing to consider is is uh, when you when you present yourself, on one hand you are presenting yourself as just an artist and as a person, but on the other uh, other hand, uh, your energy your energy probably would will help sell you too. You, you want to project an energy that that people will find engaging and oh I'd like to see this person on stage. Uh, well, you're, you're also. You're also opening up the concept of the other parts of the supply chain, the agents and managers, because a shy playwright who doesn't want to talk to the public but has a good book or good, good script or whatever, um, if they had an agent, that agent could represent them powerfully. Right. Um, I'm trying to see whether Connor, what anything anything else I've missed in the in the chat? Uh, yeah. Um, so Catherine had a few questions, uh, Catherine Keats had a few questions, uh, about showcases as well as, um, the conference in January, when does the, oh, well, yeah. the most, so, so the most recent about, like, question I see from her is, are the venues for shows, commercial, nonprofit and universities? And so what are the kind of venues that, that, that are represented? Who are the people there that are, I mean, everything you can think about. of. Every, yeah. Everything you can think of. Yeah. Um, yeah we, we have a list um, that will be available on our website when showcasing opens of venues that people, you know, are basically historically have worked with our, you know, the artists that are affiliated with our conference for people to look through. Um, but yeah, they, they do run, run the full breadth and depth of, of different, you know, facilities. It's, it's not we also anyone. we also have seasoned presenters who do it year after year for the community mm -hmm. I see Catherine has another question Show, uh, showcase presenters showcase producers I'm talking about so let's let's define showcase because uh, um, Catherine's saying you, you, you said you produce showcases please speak more on this what, what does the showcase mean sure and um, just to be clear we don't produce the showcases it's up to each individual artist agent manager to do that themselves um, i produce showcases yeah our, yeah Mo mojo <laughs> does um and and i i'm not sure i could speak eloquently about how the hilton showcases work mojo because i know that's a little bit of a um there's showcase producers that rent out those rooms and then sublet spaces to some of our artists. I hope I got that right. Yeah, um, actually, I, I have. There were producers that we have in True who have actually taken taken um, uh, showcases for multiple talents that they represent. I remember one year Margot Astrakhan presented Richard Skipper and maybe two or three other artists as well. Right. Yeah. So I mean, there, so, there's in other words, there's it, like you started off by saying at the beginning, Mojo, that it's, it's not one size fits all. It's a very flexible right. uh, environment. It's it, you're jumping in the big blue sea. Um, Catherine still wants you to speak on this. Catherine, why don't you ask specifically what what you what you're missing? Uh, what what, uh, what? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mojo. Would you speak on um, the time requirements of? of uh, the presentation of a uh, showcase production as a producer from your point of view. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, a, a showcase room at APAP, uh, similar to what I pre pre uh, produce uh, and many, many others produce, is about a one year preparation. It takes a year to get ready because you are basically taking empty rooms in a hotel and turning them into theaters. So it's a monumental production task. Uh, some producers create uh, an entire uh, state-of-the-art theater in the ballrooms and some producers like myself create a basic presentation stage that allows the talent to shine beyond the production value. 
The costs are astronomical because it's in the, the Manhattan Theater District. So you're dealing with multiple unions. Uh, you're paying for shadow labor that doesn't really show up, but if you don't pay, they shut you down. Um, you're renting, you're, you're basically renting an empty room and then creating the environment within which to deliver a showcase. Um, producers like myself uh, make time slots available so that people can just come in and do their show and leave. Uh, the blocks go anywhere from uh, 10 to 15 minutes on up to a full 60 minutes, depending on who you're working with. Uh, and some showcases are done in the hotel, which is very expensive. And some cases are, are some showcases are done outside the hotel in venues all over the city, uh, in all the boroughs. I think there have been showcases in all the boroughs uh, in my years there. So that's just uh, a timing issue. That's basically somebody who's going to find a, a, a theater space uh, that they can afford, which is always, always a good thing, and timing so that they can actually do a showcase that would fit into the schedule for APAP. And that would also require seeing the full schedule for APAP, knowing when people are more available and when they're, and when they're going to be going to make. I'm sure right, but if, as, a, as, a, as someone who wants to showcase the individual or the organization, the best target is a 15 to 20 minute showcase. Times are very strictly held. So if you have a 90 minute play, you want to deliver 15 minutes that really have the essence distilled so that someone who might want to book that show will get the feel of it. Uh, so I'm saying some, another tactic that some people take, because I know people have done this, is they, they book themselves during APAP with the idea that possibly they will attract some of the presenters from APAP to come and see their showcase. And they obviously they, they offer them comps. Uh, right. But it goes well beyond that, Bob. You really, you have to really know how to market and sell your showcase so that people show up. You know, it's it's the old adage: if you had a crawfish boil in your backyard, but you forgot to invite anybody, nobody's coming. So uh, you know, it's uh, you you have to market very effectively at APAP, and that's one of the skill sets you need. If you can't do it, you need someone to help you. But you're dealing with people who are very busy and some who are very powerful, and it can make or break you how you approach this. It's a huge investment, and you want, to mon you want to make sure that the return on investment is there. I do not recommend showcasing at APAP or even intending APAP if you're dealing with a $500 product, because you'll never return your investment. But if you're dealing with a five, 10, 15, 20, $100,000 product, one sale and you've got your investment back. That's the way I look at it. Okay, so that that probably gives some people in the room a little pause because there a lot of people in the room are, are probably thinking on a smaller smaller scale right now. Um, they if they if they could get to get if they could get thirty thousand uh, dollars together, they could produce a showcase of, of their show in, in, here in New York. Um, thirty thousand. No, no, 50, honestly, 000. honestly, honestly, if, if you can. Uh... If you can put together a uh, thousand to to two thousand dollars for showcase space, you can present your showcase. But you have to remember you got to get there, you got to stay there, uh, you have to get gear there if it's not provided. So it, you know it's a, it's a complex economic question. There's no doubt that attending APAP as an experience, the return on investment is like going to college for four years. It's worth it. Uh, when you start showcasing, then you've got some numbers you got to crunch. Okay. Um, we're we're, all, we're always as artists, we're always dealing with with the with the uh, the challenge of, of finding the money to to get ourselves seen. Um, and I think we all hope that somebody is going to discover us and and spend the money on us, but it doesn't always happen that way. Um, well, you know, if, they, if nobody we're, knows we're, you're there. If nobody knows you're there, they're not going to discover you. That's true. Well, we're yeah. we're very big on self-producing, though. I mean, one of the things that we teach in, in True is is to be a self-producer. Uh, a lot of artists hate doing it, but it's a it's a part of it's a part of the job description. It, uh, otherwise, otherwise you're basically a writer who keeps scripts in the in a in a, in a drawer. You're you're not really getting yourself out there. 
Um, what what uh, Catherine wants to know: What level of membership does one have to be able to have to be to be able to do a showcase? Yeah, I'm actually was just writing her back. Um, it would be recommended to join as a full artist agent manager member, um, organizational member, in order to showcase because that also gives you the flexibility if you wanted to have a booth to do that. Um, it also allows you to have the name in your group in your materials and your record, whereas we, we do have some individual membership categories. Um, now, if you are just an individual uh, performer or playwright or one person show, um, that might work for you, but we usually recommend the artist agent manager category, um, the full organizational category. So um, to the room, uh, does anybody have any other questions that you'd like to ask? Because I, I want to get you guys involved more. Um, you can Right. Do you know how to do a virtual hand raise? It's in reactions down at the bottom of your of your frame. You'll see breakout rooms, reactions, and more. And reactions is what you want to click on, and then you click the virtual hand. Um, let's see. Joan Lyman wants to know, what about using a 15-minute excerpt of a videotape of a live stream performance as a substitute for showcasing your work in person if it's geographically difficult to attend? complicated um, yeah well you could do a, a live stream performance as on the online platform i don't know that you would show that stream in a room where other people were doing live i don't think we do that um but on our online that's certainly a possibility although mojo i don't know have you been in showcase rooms where people it's mostly live performers and then someone streams a video. Does that, does that happen? It happens. I know when they, when, uh, oh, okay. when Gallo, when Gallo films made the movie about my life and career, uh, I actually bought a slot and showed the movie. Okay. There you uh, go. It was well attended. It was well attended. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the virtual showcasing options that APAP has offered work pretty well. So uh, you, you don't have to attend physically if, if you can't, uh, but people can still see your work. You still have to do a tremendous job of marketing so that they click on your link because you're going to be uh, you're going to be in a pool with a thousand others. And you want them to take time to see you. That's that's the big stumbling block for everybody. I mean, well, I mean. I won't say all artists, but most artists have a sort of cert, certain degree of shyness somewhere deep inside. And it, it, the idea of sort of going into this place with 4,000 people and being noticed is for some of us intimidating. <laughs> it's just insane. Well, you know, you know, Bob, that's, that's a real issue. Uh, and, and that's an issue that we deal with when we're talking with artists and, and creators about whether they should have a manager or a booking agent. Uh, and the, the question is, if it's not something you know how to do or you're comfortable doing or you're not good at it, get somebody who is good. My, my favorite story is Zuppa the Clown, who's in the fifth generation of his family circus. And I was his mentor. He came to APAP the first time and I was with him. And he, he, I said, what do you want to accomplish at APAP? He says, I want to find a, an agent and a manager. So I just looked at him and I said, Zuppa, you are you willing to give 40% of every dollar you make to an agent and a manager? He said, yes. And we found him an agent and a manager, and they're still together all these years later, put together at APAP. That's a nice story. I like that. Glad yeah, it's a that. true story. Good. True story. No, I, I, I wasn't questioning that. I'm just saying it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's always nice to hear when things work out like that. Um, yeah, and Eric is saying a writer getting an agent is not so simple. For write, writers, agents are almost unavailable. Agent well, you, come on. you get a you get an agent for your product, not for your writing. You get no, an agent for your play, for your play, not for your self as a writer. Does that no, make no, sense? no, 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 no. Eric is absolutely right. I, I know, I know the the literary agent market, and literary agents are very. Very not talk. I'm not talking about literary agents. I'm talking about business agents or booking agents or a manager to okay. actually or a manager. Yeah, I don't think writers have thought in terms of managers. So it's an interesting thing to add to to our sort of repertoire. 
Um, Something you learn at APAP. <laughs> so a writer can have an, have a manager, not necessarily a, a literary agent, because literary exactly. agents are are very they, they hesitate to take on anybody in, until there's an actual contract. Uh, it's generally what happens. Oh, by the way, everybody, we're gonna have we're gonna have literary agents on in May. I think it's gonna be May or June. I'm, I'm gonna have a, a lineup of, of, of agents you can talk to. Um, anyone else have any questions and? Managers and what 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 is this? Oh yeah, they're Vinny managers. Another true Friday talk. Uh, well, managers, I've already I've already taken care of the of the agents. I've already <laughs> sent an email about those. I'll look for managers too. Sure, I will look for managers. Well, I will you, do it. If you haven't invited um, Napama to, um, you know, come to this, you might consider having their leadership come and give you a a basic about Napama. I think that would be. A great thing for you guys to do don't know them so i would yeah you'll have to email me uh, yeah i i can introduce you to them um i just rolled off the board i i spent six years on the board ah yeah real real good people and can give you a lot of information from that segment of the industry oh and michael michael de catano just rubs it in her face that us hollywood guys have managers thank you michael <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, um, entertainment attorneys, blah 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 blah. Yeah, so there there are different yeah there are different relationships. Uh, so uh, if if nobody has any other specific questions for Sue and, and Mojo, guys, you usually have lots of questions at the end. No. Wait 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 for it wait for it wait for it. Nope, no hand raises. Well, well, and the one thing again, I'll just put out, and I don't want to speak for Mojo, but um, please. Honestly, we're very approachable. If, if, please reach out to both of us. We'd be happy to talk, you know, about your unique situation or maybe questions you didn't really want to ask on the on the webinar today. Um, very happy to help you um, one on one. Um, and it's it's always great to meet potential members and new members. So I, I certainly welcome getting to know all of you. Oh, Mo, Mojo, can you put your email and in the chat so everybody can, so people can contact you um, uh, i can't type it in but if you go to if if you go if you go to redhotmojo.com r-e-d-h-o-t-m-o-j-o.com um everything you need is there i, I can put it in the chat if that's It'll okay with you mojo yeah but if they if they go right to redmojo.com they can even ask for 15 minute conversation so they can decide what they want. Okay, so so specifically, how how much does a membership cost? Sure, um, and that is not an easy answer because we have five different organizational membership types and three individual categories, and they all have different places. Plus, I will say um, we have been offering what we've been calling a no barriers uh, membership dues relief program since the beginning of COVID which essentially means if you can't pay the our you know any of the dues within the ranges that we offer we will work with you to find a dues amount that will fit your budget. Um, our philosophy for the last two years has been we do not want anybody left out. Um, we want everyone at the table. So essentially we will work with you to find a category and a dues amount that will work for your budget. We're being very flexible um, and this will be available through the end of June. So you, you have this is, 90. This is, this is part of your no artist left behind program. Yeah, it really is. I mean, when, when COVID, you know, first hit and we were all in the depths of, oh my God, what is this going to do to our industry? And, um, you know, so much concern about all of our future. We wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to remain connected to their colleagues and peers during a, a, a terrible time. Um, so we are offering, um, you know, dues relief. And, and again, what that means is, is pay what you can. So I would be happy to, to reach out or, you know, answer any questions one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, for people who are interested in joining, but I'm sure we can come up with something, um, honestly, for anyone on this call who's interested in joining, um, just, just reach out to me personally. 
Um, Sue, uh, Stephanie, I'm sorry, Stephanie Rum, uh, Rummel, would you like to ask your question and then Joan Lyman has a question and then, then we're going to wrap up. Oh, should I speak? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know what are the next steps for, for the next APAP in, in January 2023? If you plan it now, what kind of steps would you suggest to do um, of connections and strategies um, if you have your play or your show? or your solo show going? Sure. Um, we anticipate that we will have rates and prices and um, dates for when registration will open in June, um, all ready to go in July. So I would say for those of you who are not members, join soon because what that means is you'll start getting all of our emails telling you all these things that are coming, like, you know, registration's about to open and these are our prices and these are what we recommend. So if you're not a member, the spring is a great um, time to join. But um, Stephanie, definitely there will be more information about, you know, prices, booths, um, showcases. June, July are our target dates to be able to provide everybody with, um, you know, specific information about associated costs and what your next step should be. Um, just, just for the for the room, uh, Mr. Mojo's internet uh, dropped, so he's he's no longer he can't he can't get back in because he has no internet. So, uh, uh, Joan, do you have one question, and then we can then we'll um, we'll wrap up. Yeah. Um, in, in addition to covering the cost of coming in January, what other benefits do you get by being a member of APAC? Um, sure. Yeah, I, I kind of went over those at the beginning. But oh, sorry, I are, came in late. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that's okay. I, I went over those in the beginning. There are quite a few on our website. Okay. Actually, let me quickly see if I can. No, that's okay. I can go on the website and do it. I don't want to take up your time. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. There, no, there are quite a few um, really great benefits and okay. services. Um, you know, we sort of have a live show. It, we call it the live performance calendar, but it's a live showcase calendar. Um, we have a listening lounge with our CEO. We have a, a newsletter, um, quite a few, um, quite a few benefits. So right. thank yeah. you course. So Sue, it's just you and me now. Uh, in absentia, thank you, uh, Mojo, for being with us. And thank you, Sue, for finally, finally getting here. I, I, we're, we're, we're nice people. It wasn't, it wasn't bad, was it? You're no. Okay. And, and, you know, I was going to say, um, you know, as we get closer to conference and, and having more things planned out, you know, I can, I can recommend to my, the conference team, you know, if you ever wanted to have them appear to talk in more detail about the conference, I'm sure they'd be willing to, to come back and, and give you guys a more deeper dive. It's hard for me right now because we don't have a lot in place yet. Yeah. We're, you know, we're still kind of formulating prices and structure and we're still negotiating with the hotel. Um, so I apologize that I don't have a heck of a lot of specifics to share. Well, we have tons of information though. So I, I very good grateful. good but yeah um we we and you're are a very easy guest you're a great speaker thank you well of course you know this is this has been lovely and um you know again i i really honestly mean it when i say you know call me email me would love to get to know all of you and and um bob is a wonderful human being so <laughs> i'm happy to have true in my life now Oh, good. Thank you. We're happy to have you. I, we've we've actually been circling each other for like fifteen years at this point. I know. I know. It's the way it goes, right? We're a little we're a little small community, so yeah. Um, well, thanks you guys for um, letting us join. It really means a lot. Um, I wish I could stay for the chat rooms. Unfortunately, I have to get my teenager to his his evening job, but okay. <laughs> Understandable. So I'm going to just say a thank you to, to the room. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. Thank you, Sue, for being with us. Thank you, YouTube viewers who are watching. Uh, great to have you here, too. And I'd like you to come be with us in person, if you can. Not in person, on Zoom in person uh, on Fridays. So uh, email me at trunltd at aol.com. That's trunltd td at aol.com and put zoom me or use zoom in a clever way in your headline in your uh, subject line when you send it to me and we'll put you on the list and we'll invite you every week so you can come be with us and be part of the community um we do this for free if necessary uh, we 
are a business that has to have business expenses get get paid, like salaries and things. So if you can give us a, a donation, we appreciate it. Uh, that would be true donate, trudonate.com, trudonate.com, uh, which I think Connor will put into the chat as well for everybody in the room. And uh, also YouTube viewers and tr my true community, subscribe to the <laughs> true YouTube channel. Um, if we get a thousand subscribers, they give us perks. I can't wait. Um, we're at, we're at 140 right now. So, they, so there's like, what is that? 860 to go. So tell 860 of your nearest and dearest friends to subscribe to the true YouTube channel. And, um, we'll see you next week. Uh, next week, actually, we're going to talk about the true speak benefit that we just did. I'm going to have some of the directors and some of the technologists uh, talk about how we put together the various pieces in the true speak benefit. So um, that's it for everybody.